Hey y'all, it's your girl Nye here, back with another video. Today is Mystery Monday. Um, everything will be listed down in the description box, all my social medias, the links I used, everything. Uh, check out my TikTok to see how I treat this look today at P underscore N-K-D-U-C-H-E-S-S. -S. Also, this is the same name for my Instagram, Pink Duchess. Um, everything will be listed down below, like I said, so take it easy. <laughs> um, thanks for tuning in with me today. If you like this video, please leave a like. Even if you dislike it, leave a dislike. Um, subscribe to my channel so you can stay tuned for when I upload my new videos. Um, also comment down below. I would love to see your opinions on all my videos and see what y'all think about this. Thank you. So in the 1930s, in Cleveland, Ohio, was an up-and-coming city, meaning it was on the rise. As the city is, like, growing, they need more laborers and um, help just help to support our steel and manufacturing base. Despite being in the Great Depression, a lot of Cleveland citizens were starting to get back on their feet. During this time, though, one of America's most prolific and gruesome serial killers was running loose through these parts like can you imagine a serial kill like oh my god in september of 1934 in lake Erie, which is very close to cleveland ohio a woman's body washed up ashore well what seems to be a woman body but what everybody saw was a woman's torso with her thighs still attached but amputated at the knee it was believed that she had may have been covered in some type of substance that turned her skin red and tough like leather. Some other body parts was found, but never her head. This woman was never identified either, and she is known as the Lady of the Lake to this day. Without any leads or any clues, the case grew cold. About a year later on the east side of Cleveland, in Kingsburg Run, Kingsbury Run? Yeah, Kingsbury Run. Two more bodies were found, somewhat the same way as the other body. Kingsbury Run in the 1930s was considered to be like the hood or urban side of town. Um, a lot of crime happened in this area. This once had a natural watershed that drained storm water right into the uh, river. Like during the Great Depression in this area, one of four families didn't have an income at all. Many families lived in harsh, some harsh conditions. This area was just filled with a bunch of trash and waste. Many people built homes out of this trash in the mud that was nearby. Like it was seriously dark times. Nearby is Cambury Run, and this area is called Roaring Third. This area was like a mini Las Vegas. It had a couple of brothels, a few bars, and some gambling dens. It was close to a train station, so a lot of people were visiting or coming and going. This was a busy area. That's what I'm trying to say. In September 1935, these two teenage boys was work walking, like just walking around, chilling, when they discovered the decapitated body of a male. When the investigators arrived on the scene, this body was naked, like literally they ju he just had on a pair of socks. He had rope burns all around his wrist. All the, of his blood was drained from the body, like not one drop of blood, like nothing. There wasn't any blood on the crime scene, around the body, anywhere, no smudge marks, nothing. Also, his private area was gone. So no head, no blood, and no privacy, if you know what I mean. <laughs> this body was identifiable by using the victim's fingerprints, thank God. The victim was 28-year-old Edward Andrasi. As the police searched the area, they found no evidence, but they found another decapitated male body with his bottom area cut off again. So now the police are thinking, okay, this this has to be the same person like this body has some chemical poured on it that resembled the lady of the lake the victim's skin was also red and rubbery like leather he wasn't dead as long as the other two victims edward was dead about two to three weeks before being found and this guy was fresh unfortunately he wasn't able to be identified 
Now, the police are putting two and two together, and they are talking amongst their colleagues like this is a serial killer. January 1936, a woman is out shopping, just handling her business, when she finds two baskets sitting on the side of this building she's walking past. She sees something wrapped in it, like what seems to be newspaper. You know what I mean? So when she goes up to it and open it, it is human body parts. She wasn't really sure about what she was looking at, but it seems to be like skin and just parts of the human body. When police arrived, it is confirmed that it is definitely someone's body part. It's a woman wrapped up in these baskets, like her body parts. Investigators are searching this area and around it for days, and it took them 10 days for them to recover most of her body parts. It was like an Easter egg hunt for this woman's body parts. They would find some in like bushes here, bushes over there, like, and just around. But her head was missing and she died from decapitation like the other three victims. This time, the serial killer waited until she hit rigor mortis before dismembering her body. This is different from the other victims. It was said that investigators felt as if the serial killer was trying to experiment with these bodies like just to see what would happen so he's doing different shit yeah so they were apparently able to um identify her as florence or flo flo was a waitress a bartender and a sex worker she lived on the edge of warren third there were a lot of people coming in and out of town like i said before they have a train station so police are like holy shit we have to hurry up because the killer could easily flee or he probably already fleed. Investigators are questioning people but aren't getting anything. This guy is good. The morning of June 1936, two boys were out playing and just walking around skipping school. Normal teens. Um, I know the people were scared. Like, these people were scarred. Like, all these people finding these bodies and these kids finding these bodies, I know they were scarred for a while. So, the two boys found a head wrapped in shorts. Like, literally. They called the police and the police take the head and the next day they find another body of a man. This man was in his 20s and he was dumped right in front of the police station. Again, drained. No blood, just squeaky clean. But this body was still like, it was still like put together, not dismembered as the other victims. But where is the head again? The victim is decapitated. Another unidentified victim. This victim has six tattoos and the police released it to the public, hoping that they would get something from it. But sadly, they, nothing came from it. He is known as the tattoo man. What if the killer was bringing his victims into town? Because the train station was like literally right there and he probably had like a little killer slash workstation in town and that's where he would kill and drain his victims. This victim was dead for about two months. This victim was killed on the spot. So maybe he saw something he didn't have any business seeing and the killer is like, you know, I have to, well, not have to, but I have, well, I got to get rid of him. So, the other victims were killed in various locations and just scattered around town. By the body, investigators found bloody clothes. And there was large amounts of blood at the scene. This time, it was blood there. His head was wrapped in the bloody clothes that were found. And in September 1936, a man arrives at the train station. You know, he's about to leave town when he trips over a freaking torso. He said he looked back and it was a man's torso. I would definitely, I would have fell. Like, I would have fell. I would have tripped and fell. Definitely over a torso. But the area was very bad. Like I said before, it was piles of trash everywhere. So, I don't know whether, it, you know, it don't seem weird, but it could happen. I didn't know there was a pool nearby, but it was said that this excuse you it was said that this pool was like just one big open sewer filled with everything so investigators are like i'm not going in there you're going in there no so literally they had to go get a diver like they found a diver that was willing to dive in this pool and search 
As the diver is searching this pool, he finds the lower half of the torso and parts of both legs. Sadly, this victim, this will be his victim number six. And at this point, everything is all over the news. So the public know that there is a serial killer on the loose. This victim was decapitated also and seems to be in his late 20s. The coroner, 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 there we go. The coroner is viewing the body and notice there are any hesitation marks on the body, which means whoever is doing this is very strong and confident. And he knows and this person seems to know a lot about the human anatomy. The victim head was chopped off in one clean just chop. Like this victim was sadly also unable to be identified. Six killings in one year. Investigators were stomped. There were any leads, suspects, or evidence, nothing. Everyone was scared because of this. Like, remember the news was reporting on this every day, all day. The media called him the mad butcher. The mayor steps up and hires a new safety director. His name is Elliot Ness. They put together like a team of some like some of the best of the best to solve this case. They went undercover, like just to go around the city and just talk to the citizens and try to figure out what is going on. At the time, they interviewed over uh, 5,000 people. This was the biggest police investigation in Cleveland history. And this led to nothing, nothing. In February of 1937, a man found the upper half of a woman's torso washed up ashore. And her cause of death wasn't decapitation, though. Unlike the other victims, it was believed she was decapitated after she had already been dead. Three months later, investigators found the lower torso washed up on shore. Sadly, she was unable to be identified. June of the same year, a teenage boy was hanging out just under the bridge, chilling, when he comes across what seems to be a human skull. Next to the skull, he finds like a duffel bag filled with skeletal remains. Investigators are able to determine that the remains was of a 40-year-old woman, and they were able to identify her through her dental records, and she was identified as Rose Wallace. The next month, literally, July 1937, a National Guard found the first length of the eighth victim in a pass and tugboat. And when police searched the river, they found the entire body, but never found the head. This victim was gutted from the abominable and the heart was ripped out. This victim was never identified either. Like, what the hell is going on at this point? Like, what was this person doing with these heads? Like, what's going on? Like, they don't have nothing, no leads, no nothing. So this, that makes me feel like the person probably ain't from this area. Like, literally. Like, this is crazy anyway so things calm down like for a good year so investigators are like did the killer leave town is it finally over no because on april 1938 a man was on his way to work when he saw what he thought was a dead fish on the riverbank when he walks up to it he finds out that it's the lower half of a woman's leg not the full leg either just the lower half like ankle, foot, like that type of stuff. A month later, police find two duffel bags in the river with both parts of the torso and most of both legs. Most of both legs. Not all of it, but most. But this time, the coroner, the coroner, why well, I keep saying that, detected drugs in the victim's uh, system. So they are trying to find, figure out, was the drugs given to her? Or did she take them herself? This is good. We're finally getting somewhere. The victim's arm would have gave a lot of answers, like would have answered a lot of questions, but unfortunately her arms was never found. He's good. He's good. And sadly, she wasn't able to be identified either. A few months later, August 1938, a victim's torso was found again. The torso was wrapped in a man's blue blazer and a large old quilt on top of it. The legs and arms were found in a makeshift box wrapped in butcher paper, like the paper we get from the meat department, that paper. And 
two rubber bands held that together. Ooh. The head was found nearby, but wrapped on its own in the same way. And it was said that some of the parts look as if it has been refrigerated. I hope he's not cannibalism. I hope he's not. I hope he's not doing that. Like I hope he's not. Like it was said. Like oh my god! As investigators searched around, they found remains of another body, another body. Like what the freak? Like, oh my God, they were never identified at this point. It, it seemed as if the killers was taunting Elliot Ness, the lead investigator, investigator that they um put on the case. Like, another body was found plain in plain sight of his office at this time. Like, boy, oh boy. Boy, oh boy. This messes with Elliot, you know, his manhood, his pride, because he was famous. Like, he was the one, the one who brought down Al Capone. What he does next is just messy and just fucked up. Elliot rounded up 35 police officers and detectives to go search for the killer in the hobo jungles. That's what they call the area. This is where all the rundown houses were and where all the homeless people are living. And he is believing like, this is where the killer is living. Like, this is what he's thinking in his head. So, they went house to house throughout the whole run, arrested over 63 men while the police and firemen searched the deserted sheds for evidence. Ellie was pissed. This killer really got to him, like he blacked out at this point. He calls the police and tells them to burn all the shacks on fire, basically burning down half of the town. Like they literally burned down the whole section. This is just sad. This is where the homeless people were. Like, it was, they just got over the Great Depression or in the Great Depression. And people just, some people hadn't got on their feet fast enough. So this is where some of the people were staying. Like, oh my God, so sad. The media is reporting all of this. And this made the people pissed. Like, they are pissed at Elliot. Like, oh my God. He, people knew that Elliot raided this raid was not going to do nothing to solve this case. Like, it didn't help with nothing. People are thinking, like, whoever is responsible for this has to be familiar with the human anatomy. That means the person would have to be a doctor or so what. And what are the chances of a doctor living in that area? Exactly. The killer would need a lot of room to drain and cut these bodies. Everyone is like, you just burnt down that area for what, Elliot? Elliot used this opportunity to burn down the homeless population. Let's be real. It's crazy because after that area was burned down, the killing stopped, though, completely. Like, the killings completely stopped. In, 19, in December... <laughs> 1938, the killer sent a letter to the chief of police. The letter said, and I quote, Chief of police, you can rest easy now. As I have come out to sunny California for the winter, I felt bad operating on those people, but science must advance. Just laboratory guinea pigs found on public streets. No one missed them when I fell. Right now, I have a volunteer who will absolutely prove my theory. They call me mad and a butcher, but the truth will come out. The body has not been found and never will. Uh, but the head minus features is buried in a gully um, on Century, Century Boulevard between Eastern and Century Crenshaw. I feel it is my, dip, my duty to dispose of the body I do. It is God will not to let them suffer. And I quote. That's the last they ever heard of the Cleveland Torso Killer. But eight years later, Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia was found dead in California with the same markings of the Cleveland Torso Killer's victim. I have a video on, um, of her on one of my earlier videos. I will link it like right there. Okay. So after you're done with this video, go watch that so you can see the link. Yeah, it's crazy. She was drained of all her blood and cut in half, literally. This is why a lot of people believe she was the 
uh, Cleveland torso killer's last victim. In July of 1939, a 15... A 15 two-year-old man named Frank confessed to the murder of Flo. Frank said that he had lived with Flo and he was acquainted with the two other victims, Edward and Rose. But his story was flip and floppy and it seemed rehearsed and just all over the place. So when they arrested him and booked him to wait for his trial, Frank was found dead in his jail cell. He had hung himself what appeared to be suicide and left people just with more questions, because when his autopsy was revealed, Frank had six broken ribs, and he was five foot eight, but hung himself from a five foot seven hook. Like the hook is literally only five foot seven off the ground. Many people didn't believe that Frank was the killer. They believed that the police forced him to confess so they could just close this case. Ellie and Ness believed that the killer was still taunting him. He kept receiving letters and just different stuff that led nowhere over the years of his um, career. Most of the evidence from this case was sadly destroyed. And that is the story of the Cleveland Torso Killer. Will this case ever be solved? Like how would it like how would investigators solve this case if most of the evidence was destroyed? I don't know. Let me know what y'all think in the comments down below. Thank you for tuning in to today's video. All my social medias uh, will be linked in the description box down below. Tune in uh, to my Black Dahlia visit video so you can see the connection. Um, please subscribe to my channel for more uploads and like this video. And I will see y'all for Disturbed Thursdays. Peace.